Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, that's all a load of rubbish, but it's very nice to be here. Thank you. And I was told I've got ten minutes, just ten minutes, to talk about something that really turns me on, so I'm going to talk about my penis. <laughs> is, is this actually... The wrong, this is the wrong meeting, isn't it? I'm looking at Kyla because I don't think she thinks I should be talking about this. So I'm going to talk about not only my penis, but alligators' penises too. And, uh, which makes it even better. Let's see if I can get this thing going. There's a few very strange things going on out in the environment in a minute, and you'll, uh, at the moment, and you'll see how this is relating to food in a few minutes' time. Alligators' penises are getting shorter, which is not particularly good news for the alligators. And there's a particular lake in, in the States called Lake Apopka in Florida, another lake next door, door to it called Lake Woodruff. And the alligators in Lake Apopka have got short penises, and the alligators in Lake Woodruff have got, have got humongous, normal-sized alligator penises. <laughs> And the female alligators, of course, come walking along and decide which lake to go to. And they <laughs> Also, I won't progress that thought process, perhaps. And also, the human sperm count is going down, which is pretty bad news, and that's a bit dear to my heart and to a number of people out there's hearts too. Male trout are expressing this protein called vitellogenin. And vitellogenin, for those that don't know, is a female egg protein, so it's a bit weird. You wouldn't expect male trout to express the female egg protein. Girls are reaching puberty earlier. If we go on like this, they'll be re reaching puberty before, before they're born. <laughs> French oysters aren't breeding, which is pretty bad news, because, of course, oysters are the French aphrodisiac. And if they can't <laughs> breed, it doesn't say much for the French. Is there indeed anybody French here? It's pointing to Charlie. So the question is, what the hell's going on? Now, a bit of science here. Everybody's got female hormones, believe it or not. Females have got a lot of them, males have got a bit of them. The way they work is by the female hormone coming into a cell and interacting with a chemical receptor, big protein, and by a sort of lock, I'll show you this in a minute, by a lock and key mechanism, the female hormone interacts with the uh, receptor in the cell, goes to DNA, switches on the DNA, and switches on the manufacture of femaleness. So it might cause breast cells to multiply, it might cause you to make more estrogen receptors or to make more female hormones or whatever. And as I say, women have got a lot of this and a lot of them, men have got a bit of this and a bit of that. <laughs> and the whole... <laughs> figuratively speaking, sorry. Right? <clears throat> Should I go home, Kyla? <laughs> what do you do? Do you ring a bell? <laughs> So let's just have a look at that in a bit more detail. This is in the simplistic detail for the non-chemists, and I'll show you a bit of the chemical stuff in a few minutes' time. So we've got, basically, the oestrogen molecule, the oestrogen receptor. Here's the proper oestrogen molecule. Here's the shape of the oestrogen receptor. That key goes into that lock, switches it on. Now, I'm going to show you some molecular structures. Don't fall off your perches if you're not chem chemists. doesn't matter. It's the shape of the molecules that are important, not the specific uh, chemistry of them. So here we've got two rather important uh, molecules. The first one is the female hormone. 17 beta estradiol, that's the red thing. And the other one's testosterone, the male hormone, which is the blue thing. And you can see they're a bit on the similar side, but males and females are a bit on the different side. And the estrogen receptor is able to distinguish between this end of the molecule. And it's able to distinguish very, very precisely uh, between those two. And it's evolved to do that. If it couldn't distinguish, we wouldn't have males and females, and therefore we wouldn't have evolved in that way. This is actually the estrogen receptor, and this was... Um, built up, I like to say I did this, but actually had nothing whatsoever to do with it. But I do have an extremely clever PhD student who had a great deal to do with it. This is the binding cleft of the estrogen receptor, uh, brought together from individual amino acids from the X-ray crystallograph. And for the chemists amongst you, you all know that's a pretty big job. It took her many months to achieve this. So this is the binding cleft of the human estrogen receptor. And stuck in the middle here, you can see, is the female hormone sitting there in its lock and key mechanism. And if you look in a little bit less detail, but more detail in another way, this is a sort of simple version. And you'll see where I'm going in a minute. This is a simple version of the receptor. There's the receptor. Here's the female hormone. The lock and key bit requires this shape at the end here with a lo load of water-repelling molecule, hydrophobic molecule. And at each end, it needs this sort of chemical group, an electron withdrawing chemical group, a hydroxyl group. And if you've got all of that, it'll actually switch on uh, the... Uh, receptor and do what I explained earlier on. And just to show that we really know what we're doing, this is a magnification of the first picture, which shows very clearly the female hormone sitting in its receptor. This is supposed to impress you, by the way, so I'd like a roll of drums and an <laughs> intake. Thank you. Oh, they're a bit slow, this lot, aren't they? What's wrong with and you can see we know this is the impressive bit, uh, and it's sounding like I, I did this. I didn't. 
that we know which amino acids are actually involved in the interaction. So we can begin to predict now which molecules might interact with the estrogen receptor. So there are molecules out there in the environment that look a bit like the female hormone. And these are the molecules that are responsible for the things, or we think at least, responsible for the things I described right at the beginning. And this slide is supposed to confuse the hell out of you, but what it does show, if I can get this right, is the red thing is the female hormone, and these other coloured molecules I'm going to talk about in a minute, they're different molecules that have the same sort of chemical attributes. And you don't need to be a chemist to see that. So they've got a sort of key type shape that fits into the lock that oestrogen fits into. It's like a key with a few notches missing, basically. And just to make that point, here's a few of them. So there's the female hormone. This is a chemical called genistain, and I'll talk about it more in a minute. This is a chemical called bisphenol A, and I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. And this is a, a, a chemical called non-alphenol or hydroxy non-alphenol, which I'll also talk about in a minute. But the reason for showing you this is you can see they've all got the hydroxyl groups at each end, and they've all got this long hydrophobic bit in the middle. And each one of these molecules, and there are many more like this around, each one of these molecules will fitch, switch on the estrogen receptor. So let's look at the first one. This is bisphenol A, and I've just superimposed. I'm very proud of this because I've only just returned to being an academic. I used to be a, a pro vice chancellor at the University of Canterbury, which is pure administration. I've gone back to research. I had to learn all the modern drawing techniques to impress the students. <laughs> and I've just about mastered this thing called ChemDraw. And I look, you've got to look for a few minutes at that. That is stunning. <laughs> <laughs> that, that took me three days <laughs> to draw. <laughs> An undergraduate chemist would do it about 17 nanoseconds, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> and you can see this molecule's got all the attributes necessary. Now, this molecule just happens to be the monomer of a plastic called polycarbonate plastic. And it's also used to make lacquers that are used for the inside of tin cans that are used to pack foods in. Don't need to go much further. This is in your food. And it's been shown quite recently, we've done some work and we're just doing some now actually, that this is excreted in most people's urine. So we're all being exposed to this. So the men that are being exposed to it are getting their nice little estrogen receptor turned on. It didn't expect to be and didn't want to be, which is probably why the sperm count's going down. And the women are getting their receptor turned on as well, but it makes not a jot of difference because they've got so much estrogen in any case that this makes no difference to them, unless they're prepubertal and then they've got the same amount of estrogen as men and that suddenly makes an effect and switches on their puberty. Here it is. We've modelled this here. This is from my PhD student, Lisa Graham's work. We've modelled it sitting in the estrogen receptor. Not a perfect fit, but you can see that it actually fits in. It's got an activity of 10, times, 10 to the minus 4 times that of estrogen. Here's another one, genistain. It comes from soya beans. So if you eat soy, you get a do dose of genistain. And this is an environmental estrogen and can switch on the estrogen receptor about 10 to the minus 5 times the activity of estrogen. So you're getting all these all the time, combinations of them from the environment and in your food. And they're insulting our poor little maleness, which is really very sad. <laughs> Before I make a comment like that, I look around to see the proportion of women. It's quite high, so I can get away with that <laughs> very nicely. And at this point, I should say, how many people have eaten soy today? Hands up, please, children. How many? Oh, you've eaten it today. Good Lord. Not many. So you're all thinking, no problem for me. How many people have eaten bread today? Soy bread in New Zealand contains 30% soy flour. <laughs> <laughs> so, just to make you feel even worse, this is 17 beta estradiol with genistain from soy superimposed, and you can see the hydroxyl groups line up beautifully at each end, and it's got this lovely hydrophobic region in the middle. And finally, I want to talk about this one, because this is a bit of a weird anomaly, and this is where my research is going. And this makes me very excited, actually, so you just have to bear with me if I get a bit peculiar <laughs> when I'm talking here. One of my students said, how oops, how appropriate, it looks just like a sperm, which is a very good observation. He's never going to get a degree in chemistry. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> Poor bloke thinks he is, which is a great shame. <laughs> So this is non-alphenol. It's a detergent molecule used a lot in industry uh, to clear oils and things off machinery. And if rivets are manufactured, it's used to take the oil off the rivets before they're sold. Very, very high use. It's also used in some kitchen products. I'm not allowed to say this. It used to be used in Mr Muscle, the um, cleaning fluid. It's not allowed anymore. It's banned. And it's banned because it's estrogenic. So you might be thinking, this sure bloke's just going off on what he's interested in. This is now beginning to have an impact. And chemicals like this are being banned around the world, and this is one of them. But if you look at its structure, it don't look like no estrogen. 
Well, I went to a meeting in Glasgow about three years ago, and I put this slide up, a very similar slide, not exactly this one. And I said, well, look, if you look at non-alphenol, it looks like that. And if you sort of redraw it a bit, it looks like that. And if you stick a hydroxyl group on the end, it looks like that. And if you put that over the top of estrogen, it looks like this. And at this point, the audience, a huge audience in a big international conference, thought it was a joke. And they laughed because they said, you know, this bloke, you can draw it in any way you like and it will fit. So I spent the last four or five years trying to prove them wrong, basically. <laughs> <coughs> and, what, and what actually happens, we now know, and I didn't do this work, this is done by others in the UK, Susan Jobling, actually, is that this molecule, forget the shape for a minute, is metabolised in the environment to this. So if this gets out into the environment, it makes this. Now, that made me very excited when I knew that. Also, if you take a dose of this, your liver converts it to that, which also made me very excited. It doesn't take much to excite me. <laughs> and there I speak from the heart. Although with the continuing increase in the amount of estrogen in the environment, it's going to take an awful lot more. <laughs> <laughs> so I got Lisa Graham, who's one of the cleverest PhD students I've ever had. And she's fantastic. She's working with me at the moment. Or I'm working with her, actually, which is nearer, <laughs> nearer to the point. I got her to model the shape of non-alphenol in the chemical environment of the estrogen receptor. Now, we've got a quite amazing computer modelling programme that we're using at the moment. Just to get an idea, you know, if you buy a, some software normally, it's a few hundred dollars now. This was $150,000 just for the software. So we're talking about quite complex software. And the, um, the runtime for doing this sort of modelling, because we can't interface it with a supercomputer yet, is about three days. So it's quite a long time just to get the model. So what she's done, she's loaded up the estrogen receptor. She's put 17 beta estradiol's molecular structure into the receptor, showing what shape it's in. Then she's put non-alphenol in, hydroxy non-alphenol with the hydroxyl groups at the end. And you can see it does actually fold into pretty well the same shape that I predicted. And what looks like is happening is that this molecule actually folds into the shape that suits the estrogen receptor. So it's an induced fit. We just today got the paper accepted, uh, which reports this, which makes me very happy. And just to make it complete so you know we really are doing it, this is, these are the important amino acids in the receptor. So what we've done here, we've taken all the other stuff away because it's just too complicated and just left the important amino acids with non-alphenol in the three, the three shapes it, it forms and it's interacting with the same amino acids that, uh, that 17 beta estradiol, the female hormone, does. So it's weird, that, isn't it? Because you can't understand why a receptor that's so specific would evolve to allow that level of promiscuity. And the reason is that it was very specific just for the two molecules it had at the beginning of evolution, testosterone and estrogen. And since then, particularly since the Industrial Revolution, we've thrown a whole load of molecules at it, and it's just totally confused. It didn't evolve with those in the system. Another million years, it might have evolved, in fact, to distinguish between them, but it might not. And just for the last minute, just want to explain to you something that's getting quite exciting in my mind. We've not done any work in this area yet, but it's just a postulate. But there's a little bit of evidence out there. So this promiscuous estrogen receptor might well have a very important ecological purpose. Biology usually, I shouldn't put always, has a purpose. Sometimes we just don't understand it. But if you look here, here's 17 beta estradiol, and again, Lisa did this for me, and she's modelled it in the environment, the chemical environment of the estrogen receptor. And over the top of it, there's another molecule that she's put in the same receptor, and then we've just superimposed them. And you can see that it, you know, it doesn't have dissimilar shape. And we know that, the, I'm going to tell you what it is in a minute, we know that this molecule will switch on the estrogen receptor, and we know it's quite estrogenic. This is a plant hormone um, uh, called gibberellic acid. And what we think might be happening is, and why the estrogen receptor might be promiscuous, is gibberellic acid is produced particularly, it's a hormone in plants, and it's produced when the plant is going to produce a lot of seeds next year. This is really simple biology. Sorry if there's a biologist out there. But basically the levels are high if the plant produces lots of seeds the next year. And if an animal eats that plant, it might signal to the animal, because it might sit in its estrogen receptor, ovulate, because next year this tree is going to produce food for your babies. And we think this might be happening. And the Kakapo is a good example. I tried to get an, uh, a, a grant to do this work, but got turned down, unfortunately. It was a very badly written grant. I'll get another go next year. <laughs> they should the, have been here. You should have been, yeah. They should have been here. The, the cat, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you do it to invite people from Marsden next time? We'll do this again with the Marsden Committee. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and it might well work. But if you look at this molecule, it fits very well indeed. The Kakapo ovulates only when the Rimu tree produces a lot of mast. Wow. And the Rimu tree produces gibberellic acid the year before it produces mast. Wow. So it could be that that's signalling to the creature. So there might be a purpose in all this. But in the meantime, the side effect is that men are being feminised. And that's a fact. And Germaine Greer would be very happy indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Thank you.